I don't know, at least for me, I don't know how all preachers are this way. But when you finish a long series like we did through the book of James, it was wonderful, it was refreshing. Um, to me, I learned so much more than I could ever convey through preaching of the Word. But you kind of wonder for a little while what to do next. And um, I've been praying about that for some time. Even a month or two before I finished the book of James, what should I preach on next? I kept asking God, what do I preach on? What do I preach on? And then I got the music guy saying, what are you preaching on, Pastor? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't have any clear direction. And I'm just praying and reading and praying and asking God. And over the last couple of weeks, one subject kept coming to mind. And it was the subject of surrender. Surrender. Um, Say, so why, why another series on surrender? What, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with everything in our Christian walk. Churches all across America are dying. We've said it over and over. And I want to give you some, some current statistics. I know I've shared them before, but I want you, I want you to let them sink in. 5,000 churches close their doors for the last time every year. Every year. 5,000. Now, not to totally offset that, 4,000 churches are making an attempt to be started every year. Say, so, well, that's only a difference of 1,000. Right, until you add the statistic. 80% of churches started will fail within the first five years. That's current fact. 80% of those 4,000 churches will fail. Of the 20% that remain, a third of them will still fail, just not within the five-year period. Another third of them will go on, but they'll always struggle as a small church, barely making it. And the final third of that 20% will go on to be a successful church plant that will grow and flourish and will go on to possibly even start other churches. Churches are dying. Churches are struggling. Now, let me flip that coin over. Who is the church? We are. We that know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We that not only have made a profession but we've allowed the Holy Spirit to live within our hearts and our lives and to dictate what we do as a believer. We've said it many times, actions speak louder than words. See, there's a lot of people who claim to be a Christian, but their life doesn't back it up. And I think a key ingredient that is missing is surrender, commitment, consecration. I think churches all across America would be flourishing if this key idea of surrender was present. And surrendering, part of it is relinquishing our life to God. We're going to talk more about that in the next several weeks. Part of my decision to get onto this topic was from a book that I picked up about four months ago called All In. And I want to read just an excerpt from it this morning as an introduction. Why God calls us to complete consecration right before he's about to do something amazing. And I've said it before and before I continue, I love hearing stories of what God is doing around the world. I love it. When I hear of what God's doing in India or Africa or Indonesia, or any, I love hearing stories of what God is doing. And even when he's doing something over here in this part of the United States or over there in that part of the United States, it's awesome to hear that God is at work. But I don't want to hear about it everywhere else. You get where I'm going with this? I'd love to see it happen here. I don't want to read about it in somebody else's magazine. I don't want to read about it in some book that some guy who thinks he knows something about, a little bit of something about something, has written about. I want to see God do something here. And the only way for God to do something here is for every one of us as a body of believers to completely sacrifice everything that we are to everything that he asks. And part of my reason for bringing into this series is I want God to do something in my life. I'm not satisfied. Not yet. And I hope I never do get there. A band of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries a century ago. They bought tickets to the mission field without the return half. 
Instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins. As they sailed away, they waved goodbye to everyone they loved and all they knew, knowing they would never return. A.W. Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail to the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, aware the headhunters there had martyred every missionary before him. Milne didn't fear for his life because he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. For years he lived among that tribe. And when he died, they buried him in the middle of the village and inscribed this on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. When did we start believing that God wants to send us the safe places to do easy things? That playing it safe is safe. That radical is anything but normal. Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. And the complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't radical. It's normal. And he says here, it's time to quit living as if the purpose of a life is to arrive safely at death. More than 100 years ago, a British revivalist issued a holy dare that would change a life, a city, and a generation. The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. The original hearer of that call to consecration was D.L. Moody. When those words hit his eardrums, they didn't just fire across synapses and register it in his auditory cortex. They shot straight to his soul, and that call to consecration defined his life. It was Moody's all-in moment. Moody left an indelible imprint on his generation. In 1893, his sermons were literally front-page news. Can you imagine that? Every message was transcribed on the front page of the New York Times. More than a century later, his passion for the gospel continues to indirectly influence millions. Moody left an incredible legacy, but it all started with a call to consecration. Likewise, you are one decision away from totally different life. It might be the toughest decision you ever make, but if you have the courage to completely surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there's no telling what God will do. When God is about to do something amazing in our lives, he calls us to consecrate ourselves to him. And that was a pattern that was set right before the Israelites conquered the promised land. When Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do an amazing thing among you. Joshua 3.5. He goes on in one more paragraph. He says, before I tell you what consecration is, let me tell you what it is not. It's not going to church once a week. It's not daily devotions. It's not fasting. It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not sharing your faith. It's not giving God the tithe. It's not repeating the sinner's prayer. It's not volunteering for a ministry. It's not leading a small group. It's not raising your hands in worship. It's not going on a mission trip, although all these things might be good. It's more than behavior modification. It's more than conformity to a moral code. It's more than doing good deeds. It's something deeper, something truer. The word consecration means to be set apart. By definition, it demands full devotion. It's dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus. It's a complete divestiture of self-interest. It's giving God veto power. It's surrendering all of you to all of him. It's a simple recognition that every second of time, every penny of money is a gift from God and for God. Consecration is an ever-deepening love for Jesus, a childlike trust in the Heavenly Father, and blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. Consecration is all that and a thousand times more. But for the sake of simplicity, says my personal definition of consecration is this. Consecration is going all in and all out for the all in all. The problem for many of us is this. We live in a state of selfishness, apathy, and complacency. You say, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? 
We live in a world of selfishness where everything we do revolves around what we think is best and right and comfortable. Every one of us. I got two hands and a foot raised. It's all of us. We live in a life of selfishness. That's why we buy the clothes that we buy. It's, how we, it's why we spend the money the way we spend it. It's why we do what we do with our time. We're selfish people by nature. We live in a world that is caters to pleasing self. Apathy, that's our culture. We don't care about anyone else or what anyone else is doing. We only care about ourselves. And well, if that person has a need, well, I feel bad for him, but not bad enough to help. And I'm just apathetic about it, and that's just the way it is. Complacency. I'm satisfied. For many, even in this room today, okay is really just okay. I mean, how are you doing in your walk with God? Okay. And we're satisfied with that. When's the last time you shared your faith? Well, you know, I don't really like it, but, you know, that's the way it is. We're okay with that. We're satisfied with okay. We're satisfied with average. Too easily satisfied with average and mediocre. I put myself here, folks. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself, too. And I want God to do something. But it's not going to happen as long as we are living a selfish lifestyle. It's not going to happen so long as we are satisfied with okay. It's not going to happen as long as we are satisfied with average. Well, that's just life. That's the way it is. It's the way it happens. What would happen if every one of us in this building this morning would say, God, use me in some way. I don't even care. God, it's your choice however you want to do it. God, whatever you want to do, I'll let you do it. God is begging for that person. So how do I know that? 2 Chronicles 69 says that. It says, for the eyes of God run to and fro throughout the whole earth to do one thing, to show himself strong in him whose heart is perfect towards him. And the word perfect means mature. God says, I'm looking for a spiritually mature person that I can use. It's not about your talents. It's not about the lack thereof. It's not about what we think we're good at or what we don't think we're good at. It's about saying, God, use me where I'm at. You notice in Scripture how many times God used people that were not perfect, who were not very good at something. You know, there's no, you know, you know where in Scripture do you see, well, Moses, you need to go to, you know, uh, you need to go to this certain, certain seminary before I can use you. You know, oh, oh by the way, Peter, you've got to go to Jerusalem Baptist Bible College first. It's not there. It's people saying, God, use me where I'm at. It's people like Moses and God saying to him, Moses, what's in your hand? Let me use that. And over and over, God is saying, I'm looking for people that I can use, people that I can make myself strong through. So this, what, last week, I was listening to a song by a group called This Hope. And before I get into the rest of the message, I would like for you to listen to the song by this group. In the beginning, he shares a testimony about a man by the name of Nikolai Moldanovo. And what he suffered for his faith is a testimony to all of us of unwavering obedience and faithfulness to God. In the chorus of the song, I want you to listen to four exhortations that are given. In the chorus, he says, break my plans, shape my heart, take my will, and move my mind through your word. Just a simple song, but I think it shares a great message. Amen. Good morning. Uh, just a, a few years ago, we got to go to Romania for about 10 days. And while we were there, we met a gentleman by the name of Nikolai Moldovianu. And uh, Nikolai wrote uh, thousands and thousands of songs and hymns in the Romanian language. Many of them are sung uh, throughout the country. And when he was in his 30s and began to write, the communist regime that was in place at the time told him that he had to stop. And he refused. And they sentenced him to 10 years in prison in a hard labor camp simply for writing songs about our Lord. We uh, got to spend a good part of the day with Nikolai, and his, his wife told us that every day he would get up at 7 o'clock and spend two hours in quiet time with God. And every day he would uh, start this quiet time with the same prayer. He would pray, Father, break my plans.
great songs of a nation flowed from his hand and in a world of dark oppression he made a stand they told him to be silent let him away ten years was a sentence a prisoner of faith as he waited for god's timing another winter chill in the air when he thought of his own family he was filled with despair so he cried out for justice was there any other way then he gave it all to jesus as he began to pray break my plan Sometimes I grow so fearful when I count the cost. Still my heart wants to follow and to walk in your ways. To be counted with the faithful, Lord guide me today. with me for a moment. Pray with me. Those four things. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Lord, would you break our plans? Lord, break our plans. We all have an agenda. We all have things that we want to do. Things that we think are important. Things that we think we were destined for. Things that we think are best and right. God, would you break our plans so that your plan would be the one that we'd follow? God, would you shape our heart? God, would you mold within us a love for you that is so deep and so great that we could dare not have rest doing anything else but what you call us to until we walk in obedience? God, would you take our will and redirect it so that it's in fellowship with what you have for us. And God, move our minds through your word. We need your word. Apart from your word, Lord, we have no direction. Apart from your spirit's leading, God, we don't know what to do. But God, help us to be close enough to you that we would sense it 
and see it and be committed to it. <coughs> God, would you do this in our hearts this morning? Lord, I realize not everyone will be called to a Russian prison camp for writing Christian music. Not everybody will be persecuted for their faith. But Lord, we all can walk in obedience. We all can become committed and, and sacrifice what is near and dear to us to follow what is in your heart. And I pray, God, that our hearts might be willing to do that today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 34, it says this. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his life? What can a man give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. I want to take just a moment this morning to bring out just a few points in those verses. First of all, in verse 34, Jesus' call required immediate action. So how do I know that? Well, if you look at verse 34, it says this, Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself. It wasn't a, well, let's just think about this for several months. Let's kind of think, think it through and let's weigh the options out. Let's kind of just, well, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and then eventually maybe I'll get around to it. He says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. It's an immediate decision. Are you willing to deny yourself? I see also in this verse 34, Jesus' call required immediate sacrifice. He says, take up your cross. Immediately, he calls for sacrifice. It was, once again, not a long, drawn-out process, and I realize that there's a process in our sanctification. I realize that we grow in and deeper in our walk with God the longer we're believers. But this call to Jesus required immediate action. It required immediate sacrifice. And number three, Jesus' call required immediate obedience. I find so often in the world that we live in, at least my own observation is, we all want God's blessing, do we not? We, we pray for God's blessing. We say, God, would you bless our trip? God, would you bless, our, bless us with good health and safety? God, would you bless us financially? Would you bless us emotionally? We want God's blessing, but oftentimes we want God's blessing without obedience. And it doesn't work that way. Jesus' call requires action. It requires sacrifice. It requires obedience. In fact, if you, can you leave your finger there in Mark chapter 8, if you turn back to Matthew chapter 8, there's a familiar passage here that you've seen before. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, it says this, When Jesus saw large crowds around him, he gave the order to go on the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus told them, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Lord, another of his disciples said, first let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. What was he saying here? He goes, if you're going to follow, follow. Don't delay. Don't put it off for another day. Don't decide to do it later. We don't have the guarantee of tomorrow for two reasons. Number one, Proverbs 27, verse 1 says this, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. There's not a one of us in this room that has the guarantee of later. And number two, God's word is full of scripture that says that we don't know when the Son of Man will come. No man knows, knows the day nor the hour. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when Christ has come. No other time to be obedient but right now. Some people desire to be a friend more than a follower. You ever met somebody like that? Jesus is my friend. 
Life is just good. He's my friend. And you know, you know, Jesus is a friend. No question about it. But God's word answers that, that, that question as well. In John chapter 15 and verse 4. It says, Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in me. So neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. It goes on. The, this, the relationship between the vine and the branches. Bottom line is, there's no waiting. It's a friendship. It's a relationship. He says, my, you are my friend if you do what I have commanded you. Are we more than just a friend? Or is our life back, backed up by obedience? Are we willing to be more than just a buddy and have that insurance? It's so much more than that. Some people desire to be a brother more than a follower. He addresses that as well in Matthew chapter 12. I believe it's verse 50, somewhere right in there. It says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. He says, You want to be in the family? Your life has to back it up by obedience. My brother is the one who does what I say. Some people desire to be a committed follower later. He addresses that as well. Some people have the idea, well, I'll get more serious about serving God later, when it's more convenient, when I have more time, when I'm not as busy. I mean, God understands. i got to provide for my family. I mean, i got commitments at work. I mean, God, God understands that, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 the whole passage here is good, but he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Bottom line is, God wants immediate obedience. He wants more than just to be a friend. More than just to be a brother. More than just to be a follower. God wants your commitment. He wants your sacrifice. He wants your relationship. But he goes on in Mark chapter 8. In verse 35, he says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Jesus makes it clear that there are two types of people here in this passage. Those who wish to save their lives and those who are willing to lose their lives for, the, for Jesus' sake. I wonder what side that we're on. As a body of believers, as individuals in this body of Christ, which side of that are we on? Are we on the side that's going to save our own lives, or are we willing to give up our lives for the cause of Christ? I don't believe the passage is dealing with, as a whole, talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about, are you going to come to Christ or not? And if you're going to come to Christ, this is what's required by that. Let me read a verse here in John chapter 12 once again. John chapter 12, verse 25. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What a contrast. What a comparison. It really bothers, it begs us to ask, answer the question, what are we living for? What are we really living for? Are we living for the things of this life? If we are, we're, we're missing the point. 1 John chapter 2 says, All that is in this world, the love of the flesh, the lust, love of the, the flesh, I'm kidding, say it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And what does verse 17 tell us? The things of this world are going to what? Pass away. What is it that we're living for? Is it for the niceties of life? Is it for the, the retirement gold that's in the bank? Is it for the house? Is it for the cars? Even for the kids or the hobbies? What is it that drives us? What drives us? Is it a commitment to God? I can't imagine. I, I, I can't. I can't imagine being sent out as one of the disciples when 70 were sent out, and just, by the way, you may not have any place to live. And by the way, if they don't accept you in this town, kick off the dust and go to the next one. Where is the security in that? Where is the security in that? 
But yet, our whole life is revolved around creating a secure environment. The idea of trusting God is almost foreign within our Christian culture. It's almost a foreign concept within the church of God. I want to trust God, but I also got to make sure my job's there. I want to trust God, but I also need to understand that my health is important. Everything is self-centered and revolves around the idea of trusting God when it's convenient. That's our culture. That's our Christian culture. I wonder how many of us would dare to step into Abraham's sandals. Go. God, where? Just go. I'll tell you when you get there. I wonder how many of us would have dared to have been a Saul on the road to Damascus. And then here in the words, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be comfortable. Can you imagine being one of the disciples after the feeding of the thousands and being sent to the other side? And by the way, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, but you're going to face this massive storm when you're out there. Enjoy. We hate those things. We pray to God, God, keep us safe from those things. And those are the very things that God uses to display his power and his miraculous love, even. And he goes on in verses 36 and 37. <coughs> For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his life? Or what can a man give in exchange for his life? This is the person who will not deny himself for the Lord's sake. It's a person who says, no, these things are more important. These things are so important that I can't do that right now. And Scripture is full of that testimony as well. The rich young ruler says that he didn't follow because he had very many possessions. What's important? This is the person who did not deny himself. And I wonder if, by contrast, some of us kind of fit that characteristic. We love our pleasure. We love our position. We love the power, etc. Because those things are important to us. We live life as though these things are high on the pedestal. I wonder if sometimes as I look at the church of God, I say, why are churches dying all over the country? And yet, some of the foreign countries that are so poor, so desolate, have nothing, are flourishing. It's obviously not a money factor, right? Because they don't have it. I think it's a commitment factor. They realize what's most important. Some of them get it. And I realize that there are some of us that get it too. But I wonder if there's room for improvement in our own lives. He says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul? Here's a man who says, I can't do that. I still, I still got to have these things. These things are captivating me. How much is enough? Has anybody ever moved? Anybody ever moved? Have you ever just realized how much stuff we have? Isn't it unbelievable? When our kids were young, we felt God's leading to serve as evangelists and conference speakers, and we traveled all over the country in a 40-foot fifth wheel. We went from a house, that the parsonage of the, our, my first church that I pastored, it was a, basically about a seven-bedroom house, upstairs and downstairs. It was huge. They built this monster parsonage behind the church. It was, it was huge. But what happens when you have space? You fill it. That's what you're supposed to do with space, space, right? You fill it. We filled it. And then God called. And we were looking at all of our stuff, and we said, what do you do with it all? Well, we do it what most people do. You have a garage sale, get rid of it you can, and then we say, free on the rest of it and take it. I couldn't believe how much we got rid of. We really got rid of everything. 
we saved our piano and some memorable things from childhood and a few things like that, but we got rid of beds, we got rid of couches, we got rid of furniture, we got rid of everything. And we got into a 40-foot fifth wheel and we traveled all over the country. But I was amazed at all the stuff that we had accumulated. And I was also amazed at this fact. We didn't miss it when it wasn't there. What do you do with all that stuff? We gave it away, sold some of it, but we didn't miss it. And sometimes when you move, you realize you get that picture of just all the junk we got, the stuff, even good stuff, stuff. But it really reveals what we live for in our lives. If we're living for the stuff, we're missing the point. If we're living for what this world can offer, we're missing the point. Second Timothy reminds us, he says, do not be entangled with the affairs of this life. The word entangled is a really descriptive word in the Greek language. It has the idea of a fisherman's net. And if you've ever been around a fisherman's net, I mean a real one that's out on the boats, you realize how tightly knitted they are together, those ropes. and You can't hardly walk through them. If they're laying on the, on the ground, you can't hardly step over them without getting your feet caught in, your toes caught in the little webs of, web of the nets. And then put that in the picture of 2 Timothy where he says, be not entangled with, entangled with the affairs of this life. What's he talking about the affairs of this life? The world's agenda, the world's philosophies, the world's way of thinking, the culture of our present world. I'm just telling you, we can get caught up in that stuff. Anybody get all, you know, in a supply of worthless emails? I wake up to 50 to 60 emails every day from some, I don't even know how I got on their list. I have no clue. They're like all these political type things. If you read them at all, the immediate sense is that, man, we're going to die tomorrow. And Obama did this, and Obama did that, and it's all true, but who cares? You can't change it. But if we're caught up in that, we're distracted by what's most important. Now, usually every morning I wake up and go delete, 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 delete till my thumb is sore on my iPhone, getting rid of all the emails that are worthless. You know, what is it that distracts us from being fully committed followers of Christ? As we think about this idea of surrender, I truly believe that in verse 36 and 37, this is a man who says, I'm not willing to deny just yet. I'm not willing to do it. These things are still too important. In verse 38, just a continuation of it, says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with all his holy angels. That word, that verse, and the picture that, that is presented there to me is, is very clear and vivid in my mind. Whoever is ashamed of me, he says, What's the word ashamed mean? Embarrassed almost? What's he say in Romans 1.16, Paul? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the what? Power of God unto salvation. We're not to be ashamed of it. But if we're ashamed to follow Christ, ashamed to go all in, ashamed to give everything that we've got to serve Him, this person says, I'm ashamed by my actions, by my life, by my lack of obedience, by everything that is entailed in my life. I'm ashamed. God the Father says, I will also be ashamed of him. I don't know about you, but that's startling to think about that. This too is a person who would not deny himself for the Lord's sake. And really, when you get down to it in Mark chapter 8, there's two groups of people here in this, te in this text. Their actions reveal which group they're part of. 
I think we see a clear picture of someone who says, I'm not willing to follow yet. But if you are, he says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must. There's a decision to make. If you are going to follow Christ, there has to be a change. It's no longer about me. It's not about me. It's not about my comforts. It's not about my gifts. It's not about my abilities. It's not about my desires. It's not about my plans. It's not about me. It's all about the one who gave his son to die on the cross, to live a life, to be our example. It's all about him. And I'm concerned that our churches across America, maybe even our own church, has got too much self-centeredness in it. What are we doing to serve Christ? What are we doing to show our commitment to him? Not just casual Christianity. There's no room for casual Christianity. There's no room for just okay. There's no room for mediocrity. There's no room for just satisfied. I'm okay with the way things are. I had a friend call me the other day and he goes, I got a question for you. I've been asking 10 different pastors this question. And he asked me a question. He says, are you ever satisfied? I said, man, that's a loaded question. What are you talking about? Am I ever satisfied? He goes, I'm talking about your church. Are you ever satisfied? I said, no, I'm not. And I was just honest. I said, I think most pastors would have that answer. We're not satisfied. I'd love to see more things happening. I'd love to see great things happening. He says, well, I'm concerned. He says, I've talked to 10 pastors, and half of them said they're okay with it. They're satisfied with where the church is at. That floored me. Are you satisfied? In your mind, are you satisfied with the way things are? Are we satisfied that... You know, missions is, is struggling. Are we satisfied with people not being baptized and saved? And are we, are we satisfied with empty pews and, and chairs? Are we satisfied with people not being involved? Are we satisfied with that? I hope we're never satisfied with that. I hope we're never satisfied with that. You say, well, Pastor, are you trying to put us on a guilt trip? No, I'm not. Because I said, I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to me. But I hope you get the understanding of it too. Is that God does not want satisfied. He doesn't want mediocre. He says, if you're going to come, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be a part of this plan, he must deny himself. Take up the cross and follow. That's it. And it's a daily thing. It's a 24-7 thing. It's a 365 thing. And I hope that we never settle for anything less than that.